Uh, my name is Zach, and I am the CEO of Aztec. Um, we are a company that specializes in using um, zero knowledge proofs to enable to create uh, infrastructure for uh, to enable privacy preserving end to end encrypted uh, blockchain transactions. And I'm here to uh, I like to talk about privacy preserving programmable blockchain architectures. Uh, and so basically, how to use the zero knowledge proofs to enable um, a, like a genuine uh, like private smart contracts where private state is a first class primitive and tackling it from a, uh, from a, from a slightly different approach to, 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 uh, to Zama, uh, where we don't use FHE and it's all basically it's, it's using state of the art ZK proofs. And um, yeah, so what I like to do uh, for this talk is basically try and um, almost from first principles, uh, uh, like derive uh, with you, work through how to construct a blockchain architecture where you have these like programmability of private smart contracts like Ethereum, but where you have this private status first class primitives, um, where transactions can be end to end encrypted and you don't have to trust third parties or, you know, like hardware security modules or anything. It's just pure math. Uh, and ideally, um, preserve kind of existing traditional smart contract programming semantics. Because the goal here is for, is for, these, for this, these networks to be programmed by developers, not cryptographers. Um, so, um, you know, having a concept of, you know, contracts, being able to call other contracts um, and like not having to like understand any of the, like expose any of the abstractions, uh, like, uh, like any of the cryptography under the abstraction layers. Um, uh, so I mentioned like, you know, go from first principles. I, I, I do want to like just say, highlight the, the enormous corpus of work that this is all building on top of, um, you know, like the, the, the zero coin paper, Zcash, they were the absolute pioneers of um, deliver, creating private blockchains. The Zexi paper described the first practical um, way of creating like proofs of generalized computation. You know, you've got Mina who are in production today working with uh, ZK apps, and you know, there's like 40 an enormous corpus of ZK research that this is all being built off top of. Uh, so, I said first principles, <laughs> perhaps not this first, uh, this this deep. But I, I, I want to ask this question because there's a lot of fluff and abstract like uh, like abstractions that are layered on top of the concept of a blockchain. And for our purposes, we don't need any of this. For, like, at its very core, a blockchain is, it's a state machine. Um, uh, forgive the silly graphic, I read that at two in the morning. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a state machine. You have some input state, you send a transaction, you have some mechanism, some protocol that verifies whether the transaction follows predefined rules and, doing, and will update the state based on those rules. That's all it is. It's, it's pretty simple at its very core. But we want private state. We want a private state machine. And what even is private state? Because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a deeper question that's going, oh, well, the state's encrypted. Because, uh, as I'm about to demonstrate, like, that isn't enough. If you, if, you want a, if you want genuine privacy and anonymity, where you want to protect users' um, information, prevent people from being able to, like, spy on, on people's transactions, then it's not enough just to encrypt the state. Uh, because... Um, you need to start with that. And that also creates complications because now your state on your blockchain has an owner, um, which means, which um, I'll get into the complications that produces. And so, but imagine you like, um, so like the way, the way we store, um, uh, like represent state in, in blockchains in layer two is we, 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 we all use Merkle trees or Merkle picture trees, but you know, it's basically just a database. But the problem is that if you modify an encrypted state variable, then you're leaking information, right? Because you're, you're, you're leaking the transaction graph. If I'm sending encrypted Bitcoin to somebody um, uh, and making lots of encrypted Bitcoin payments, then observers will be able to see if, if that's represented as a single encrypted balance, they'll be able to see that, that some balance is changing. They won't know what that balance is, but they'll be, they'll be able to piece together a transaction graph of who's interacting with who just based, just based on observing um, what encrypted variables are changing in that database. And so how do you avoid that? Well, you have to uh, make your database append only. And by that, I mean, once you've, create, once you've added something to that database, you can't change it, you can't delete it. All you can do is just add extra things to your database. So that, that way you don't leak information about, um, uh, by, by modifying existing variables. But that seems rather limiting, doesn't it? I mean, that's not really how we, how we uh, uh, like that's not our conception of how blockchain like Ethereum works. So how, because we want to update state, <laughs> you know, you want to be able to change balances. So how do you do that? Well, um, the, the way it's done canonically and, and um, the way that maximizes the anonymity set is by using this concept of a nullifier, where um, a nullifier is effectively, it's, it's, the, it's the encryption of an encrypted state variable, uh, 
where if you don't know the decryption key, you cannot link a nullifier to its, to its associated state. Um, but what you do is basically the nullifier represents the deletion of, of a variable, of, of some object. And so you have, you have a state tree, you have a nullifier tree, and if, if, a, if a state variable in your tree has an associated nullifier, then that's basically it. That's, that's, the, that's representing that variable being deleted. And so to prove that your, like, some state exists in, the, in, your, in your chain, it's not enough just to prove that it exists in the state tree. You also need to prove the non-existence of its associated nullifier. Uh, and that can give you, that gives you genuine privacy anonymity because um, as this is how like, blockchains like Zcash work. It's how like, uh, the Aztec network um, today works where um, the act of like, transferring cryptocurrency from Alice to Bob um, just, just all it does is it adds additional encrypted values into the state tree. It adds additional nullifiers into the nullifier set. But if you do not possess the decryption keys, you have no information about what those are linked to. Therefore, um, you get very strong anonym anonymity out of it. And so basically, that kind of private state, it's, it's an intrinsically based around UTXOs, unspent transaction objects, the kind of data structure that Bitcoin uses. Um, because of this need for privacy, because account states, just the act of changing encrypted out account state leaks information. Um, so just uh, like just uh, some toy examples, you know, if you have some, some like, you know, some data, some owner, uh, like an owner of that data, you'd encrypt that to make your UTXO in the state tree, and then you'd encrypt the UTXO to make the nullifier. So here's a question, is that sufficient? Isn't like, oh, okay, so if we have this, this, this model, this abstraction for how to, how to handle private state in a private state machine, is that enough to recreate the universal applications that exist in blockchain today, the applications that people want to build? And the answer to that is an overwhelming and resounding hell no. <laughs> Uh, which is a bit of a problem, because if you if you have to represent all of your state as this as encrypted unspent transaction objects, that creates follow-on problems. Particularly, you get raised conditions, uh, because within a single block, you can't modify the same to you. You can't have two different people modifying the same to UTXO twice, because they're both trying to delete an an, an object and objects can only be deleted once, and so one of those transactions will become invalid. Um, you also have problems with the fact that encrypted state has to be owned by somebody or, or owned by a collection of people if you want to use NPCs, but ultimately um, you cannot have a deterministic algorithm running on your blockchain that modifies data like this, not at least without FHE, because, um, because you, the state update will require the, the, the decryption key to decrypt. If you want to prove a proof of correctness of a, of a, state, of a state update, then you need to cross the structure zero-knowledge proof where you provide the plain text, prove it equals a ciphertext, apply some logical operations. And so what if, what if the, 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 the only person who can make that proof is the owner of the decryption key? And what if they don't want to make that proof? Because that proof, because that transaction is going to liquidate a position that they have because they haven't made their collateral, they haven't made their, their, their collateral payments. Um, uh, you know, how do you, how do you compute the total amount of value in a liquidity pool to do an automated market maker if everything's encrypted and owned by individuals or, or, or groups of users? And so it's not sufficient just to have private state. You also need, for, for privacy preserving applications on a blockchain, you need private and public state. Um, and the, the abstraction that, 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 that I use to think about this is that you, you want, in an ideal world, to give, you want pr privacy for the user, but you want transparency for the protocol. For example, if you're actually, if you're, if you're interacting with a market maker or a decentralized exchange or some trading house or, some, or, or whatever it is, you want to make sure that the, the rules of the protocol are transparent and that people have maximum data around what's going on so they can properly audit it and vet it. You know, if you want to put, for example, uh, um, you know, you want to package up mortgages and put them on chain, well, ideally you do that in a way where that's transparent so that you can't end up with, you know, things like 2008. Um, but you want privacy for the user. Uh, and so, the, um, and so, so we need both of these state models. Um, in a for for, for in a pro programmable private smart contract universe, uh, and that again creates some knock-on problems. Um, so how do you make a public and a private state machine? Well, that's 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 tricky because for if you want to think about private state transitions, um, because everything's encrypted, then you need um, proofs of correctness generated by the user um, to to prove the correctness of any state transition. But for public state transitions, um, where you have an account model-based state. Uh, those, um, those transactions must be ordered and executed sequentially by a third party. This is what happens on Ethereum with well, miners in ETH1 or validators in ETH2. It's what happens in sequences in layer twos. And so you have these two different kind of transaction models that you have to kind of marry up with one another. Um, if you want to create a kind of like a holistic whole protocol solution to creating 
privacy preserving blockchain applications. So how do you do that? Well, to wind back a little bit, um, it can help to think about the, the, what smart contract abstractions can we, can, we, can we achieve given the conditions and constraints that the, from those previous slides. And there's something, you, you, you end up with quite a, like a, a, a natural separation boundary here. Where, well, your contract is composed of public and private functions, uh, where your private functions can update the, 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 the UTXO tree, they can update the Nullify set, they can do everything associated with encrypted state. Um, they can read from historical public state, can't write to it, but they can read from, from old states because the idea is that a user is generating a proof of correctness for a private function, so they will have some understanding of the chain state, it just won't necessarily be up to date. Uh, and they can also make unilateral calls to public functions. And by that I mean um, a private function can call a function, function, but it can't have any return parameters because uh, they're not being executed at the same time. Basically, what, what's going to happen in, um, uh, if you're processing a block of transactions, effectively, all of the private function calls are executed before the public function calls are executed. Um, so you, you can't have return parameters that are calling back into a private function because it's too late at that point because the user's already submitted their proof and have sent it to a sequencer or, or a validator or a miner. And similarly, public functions, they're going to be run by some third party uh, operating on behalf of the network, like a minor validator sequencer, um, and they can update all of the state trees, but obviously it's public, so you get no privacy, so you probably don't want to update the UTXO tree that requires providing uh, secret keys. Uh, and so how, how do you think about private, like, like these private functions at, at a protocol layer? Because if you, um, if you have one of these private functions in a smart contract, then, well, that needs to be converted into a ZK snark circuit because you want to make a zero-knowledge proof of correctness. Um, you could also use a snark, although, as I, um, perhaps I'm, this is the wrong crowd for this, but uh, uh, snark stands for succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. So, you know, snarks are, can also be considered a kind of snark. Uh, but, I mean, I, you, you know, I'm not, like, platform agnostic, snark, snark, doesn't matter, as long as it's zero-knowledge. Um, and you're, you're, so each function is basically a ZK snark verification key, and your contract is basic, is defined by the set of function verification keys. and how this would work in practice, something we've been working with, is we want to try and do this in a somewhat platform agnostic way. We have a programming language called Noir, which turns programs into ZK snark circuits. And so we're thinking, how do we turn this from a, from just a, from a programming language to a smart contract programming language? How do we add those, like, the, the, those heuristics or semantics? And so one way of doing it is you, you define a uniform ABI for how, um, how your, your, your snark circuits public inputs are going to be interpreted. So you could say this is just an example. Um, so you could say the first 10 public inputs, they're going to be the, the argument parameters to your function. You know, some of the other parameters, some of the other public inputs will be interpreted as the, the state root of the UTXO tree, the nullify set, etc. cetera, um, maybe an encrypted representation of the message center. But the important, one of the important things here is that the, the snark, each snark circuit that represents a function does not perform state updates themselves, as in they don't take the, the root of the state tree, um, insert a leaf into the state tree, and then compute the new root and spit that out. Because that requires, again, you, you get race conditions there. Because um, if, if I'm making a blockchain transaction on my phone, I don't know what the state root of the state tree of, of, of Ethereum or, or, or anything is going to be at the point that that transaction is mined. What instead you do is you emit state update requests. So the snark circuit will spit out on its public inputs, basically, um, leave, like, um, leaves to add into the UTXO tree, leaves to add into the nullifier set, things like that. Um, and so then, so that's that's how you can make a snark circuit to represent a private function. But then, how do you how do you turn that into into a transaction? Because most smart contract transactions consist of multiple function calls. You know, you might call a token contract that like to to put, like to approve another contract of spending tokens on your behalf, you would then call, like, you call some decentralized exchange contract and perform a swap. That swap contract will then make a call to a, a matching engine and then make transfer calls to other token contracts. You have functions calling, functions calling, functions calling, functions. So how do you take, so you, so you can make a proof of correctness, you can construct a proof which proves the correct execution of a function. How do you turn that into a proof of correct execution of a transaction? Basically, we need call semantics in, in this private ZK snark world. Um, which is rather uh, uh, a rather new new top topic to really tackle, um, and this is how yeah, 
thinking of doing it. So basically by using this, what we're calling the private kernel circuit, and so we're very much borrowing the nomenclature here from the Zexi protocol, where effectively you, your kernel circuit makes heavy, heavy use of recursion to sequentially vet construct proofs of correct execution of your functions via a call stack. Um, so the idea here is that, um, uh, yeah, iterative recursive computation, oh, hang on, whoop, where you're going to represent inside your, your kernel circuit, you're going to have these like various abstractions represented as, as your public inputs. You're going to have a call stack representing your private function calls. You're going to have a call stack representing your public function calls. You're going to have like um, a bunch of like a list of things that are going to be added to your state tree, to your nullifier sets. And also what, what I call like, we're calling like Oracle state, which is basically state that's been that like chain state that, that has to be supplied externally. Things like what are the state, what are the, what are the state routes that you're using? What's the message sender? What's the block cache? What's the timestamp, et cetera. And each of these calls onto this, like what is a call stack in, in the world of a ZK snark? Well, um, you know, uh, it's because snarks don't, like snark circuits don't represent programs. They represent the verification of the execution of a program. Uh, and therefore, uh, you don't just describe, a, an entry in your call stack doesn't just describe the, the function that you're calling, but it also contains a proof of correctness of that function call and the um, return parameters that are, that are expected from that function call. Um, and so this is, a, uh, this is a toy architecture for this, uh, for this kernel circuit. Um, the reality is more complicated than this, but this is roughly how, how, how such a circuit's logic would proceed. But basically you have one conditional branch where if you're basically the call depth of, your, um, uh, of, your, of, of the number of calls you made, if it's zero, you're starting from scratch. So you, you don't have any previous recursive proof to verify. Instead, you, like, you verify it a signature from the message sender. But then what you'll do is you'll pop a function off the function, a call off the function stack. You'll grab the verification key from some, um, from, from, this, from, from a state root. You'll verify the key exists. You'll verify the proof is correct. You'll extract from the proof public inputs that you will interpret according to this contract API. Um, and so, according on, um, and so that pu those public inputs from that proof may contain instructions to submit additional function calls. So they get pushed back onto the function call stack. Uh, and then um, the, you have some output parameters of this, of this snark circuit. Uh, by outputs, I mean they're public inputs, but you, you interpret them as outputs. Um, that represents the new state of, your call, of your, your, all of your call stacks. And you just run this private kernel circuit iteratively until your private call stack is empty. And that represents, um, at that point, you've constructed a proof that proves the correctness of the execution of a sequence of private function calls. And at that point, you're now ready to take that proof and hand it off to a, to a sequencer, to a miner, to, to, a, to a validator, to, com to complete the rest of that transaction um, via like, a public execution layer. So this could be a layer two, it could be a layer one, it could literally just be a team of accountants with pen and paper doing manual calculations. Like it, it is in, like, it's, 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 it's a pure abstraction at this point. But, um, if you would, but what, what this execution layer has to do is, well, it has to execute the public, it, like it has to verify the proof of correctness of this private kernel circuit, verify that the private call stack is empty, therefore nothing additional to do there. And then it'll execute all the public function calls on the public function call stack. And then it will perform all the state updates. It'll, so all of the UTXO requests that are made, it'll do those. It'll add all the nullifiers to the nullifier set. When it's adding nullifiers to the nullifier set, it also proves, it also performs check, non-membership checks, um, which basically that, that, that therefore forces, basically if, you're, if your contract is trying to delete a variable, delete some state, doing the non-membership check, verifies it's not already been deleted. Um, and verily that the user, when they've constructed their private kernel circuit, they've used the correct oracle state. So they've used um, the correct uh, state routes, or at least they've used state routes that at one point in, in the chain's history were correct. Um, and this can be done as an L1 or an L2 rollup. Um, so we're, at Aztec, we're doing this as a, as, as a, um, uh, inside a rollup for, for scalability, but um, in theory, this whole, this whole contract abstraction and construction doesn't, doesn't require it. Uh, and so, yeah, that's basically, once you have all of that, then, you, you, you've constructed an architecture where, yes, you do have private programmable smart contracts. They have familiar semantics where you have f contracts with state variables and functions. Users can call functions, functions can call functions, contracts can call other contracts, just like you have in Ethereum or Solana or other, other, L, other L1s like that. It requires a lot of recursive start composition and it requires a lot of client-side proof construction. So you need like utterly bleeding edge cryptography um, to, to actually pull this off and be remotely fast enough. Uh, so we're so something that we're um, uh, at Aztec, we're, we're 
going to be publishing a paper soon, uh, which we're calling Honk, which is a, it's a, it's an iteration on Hyperplonk. Um, to, uh, that, that makes all of this tech fast enough. And so, yes, this is achievable with today's tech technology. And that's what we're building at Aztec. So this is a, um, what we call Aztec 3. So putting, putting theory into practice, this is just a small slice of the architecture. Um, we'll be publishing the proper design documents very, very soon. Um, so this is only scratching the surface of the complexity you need to get something like this working, but uh, it, is, it is a practical reality to, 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 to pull this off with today's technology. And I'm extremely excited by this. I feel like anybody in this industry uh, should be excited by the, by the idea of actually being able to, to marry privacy with transparency, being able to do things like link identities to cryptocurrency accounts, um, protect user state, being able to um, like perform, have go like governance mechanics where your votes are private or secret, just like they are in, well, you know, um, uh, in the real world. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, this is what we're doing. That's what we're building, and that's a little bit, and just this is a, a, sl um, a slice of how we're planning on achieving that. So, thank you very much. Questions? Anything? Oh, yep. How were you affected by the tornado event? Very good question. So, it's, it's quite. Um, there's two things that, like, the, the way we think about the tornado cash event in two, there, there are two kind of is, is separate, separable incidents. One of them is the, is the OFAC sanctions, and one of them is the arrest of Alex Petsev. Um, the, for us, the, the, um, the sanctions um, that the, the US applied are, um, it, is, it is something that to, 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 concern, to be concerned and addressed by. I feel like the, the, the arrest of Alex Petsev was, you know, it's it's a tragedy. To be honest, um, I, I uh, we will we'll, we will see what happens there. But I gather he's still being held without trial. Um, so, uh, with regards to that side of things, well, we're not planning on studying for the Netherlands anytime soon. But with regards to sanctions, um, it's very important that it's that to 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 establish the fact that you can actually create compliant privacy networks, ones where you have some way of distinguishing good actors and bad actors without sacrificing the core principles of protecting users' data, or having a completely permissionless, transparent network. How do you do that? Well, we, we do have some plans, and we feel like adding programmability into, into the, at the protocol layer massively helps, because, because app developers can program their own privacy solutions. Um, but effectively, there are things, so there's actually a, spe like a specification that I've been writing up that I've been consulting with a few folks like um, uh, with. But um, what we're quite uh, keen on, like, to take your question directly, how do you create a compliant privacy network? Well, right now, there is no formal definition of what a compliant privacy network is. So the best that you can do is create one where you establish moral legitimacy and then use that as a, um, as a basis to effectively like to, to take a stand and try and, and try and argue and convince regulators and legislators that this is, um, this is like an extremely positive development for not just like the Ethereum community, but for the entire the entire world, like the, the amount of um, economic innovation activity you can open up when you, ma when you match user privacy with decentralization is quite profound. Um, and so the way that we're trying to establish that moral legitimacy is by providing solutions where you can distinguish good and act bad actors in a decentralized way. For example, one thing you can do is you, could ha you, can, um, you can have lists of deposits that are going into a privacy network that are considered somewhat like tainted or suspicious. Like they, they've interacted with, you know, like with hacks or with North Koreans. And the maintainers of this can be from a decentralized group. So like anyone can maintain a list. It could be, you know, it could be, the, it could be a foundation, it could be a centralized exchange. And the idea is that using our technology, you, you should be able to prove with a, with a, in a ZK snark proof that, that or when you're withdrawing funds from, from a network like Aztec 3, you should be able to prove that your tokens didn't touch any of the deposits in that tainted in any in a tainted list, and therefore like have a non-interactive proof that like basically saying I have, like my funds haven't touched this list. I'm following the rules, and as long as those lists are, maintain, are like um, can be maintained by anybody, then the the, the 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 hope is that you would then develop social like community would develop social consensus around which of these lists are trusted. Um, they will be thoroughly they, they could be regularly audited so that um, you know any any provider that's a bit too zealous with adding deposits to the list that aren't that are actually legitimate or too lax and letting things slip through the gaps that would all be very trans like transparently viewable and um, 
uh, ideally, the hope would be that the community would settle on its own standards for how, um, uh, like, how how to how to resolve this problem. But yeah, it's 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 tricky. I feel like the best we can do right now is just is is um, provide solutions that have moral legitimacy, and then and and go from there.